Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Community Church. Let's welcome all of our first-time guests. Great to have you here today. Yes. Y'all, somebody's been doing some praying around here because we had victory yesterday. Come on, OU fans. Woo! Are y'all ready? Y'all came ready this morning. Everybody's got their coffee. You're ready to go. So good to see you. I love second service. You know, you're one of my favorite services. There are two services I love here at New Community Church. I love first service and second service. So great to see you. Hey, do we have any deer hunters in the house? All right, we got one. <laughs> So yeah, I heard that uh, what today is the last day of deer season for hunting with a gun. I think January the 15th, if you're going to use a bow. Um, I know that maybe if you want to get your prize buck or your trophy buck, today's your day, I think, but uh, at least for this, for this season. So I have a friend that, yeah, he, uh, he was so desperate to get his trophy buck here recently. He, uh, he hadn't, all of his friends had, had shot something, had their kill. He didn't, he, he hadn't uh, shot anything or seen anything. So he was going out and just desperate, he told, took a friend and they were out there all day, didn't see anything, actually waiting until the, the evening time. It was getting dusk, it's starting to get a little dark and he told his friend, man, we haven't seen anything. Hey, before we go to the truck, you go on that side of the property in the woods and um, just kind of walk this way and see if you can rustle something up and maybe we can... Maybe I, maybe I can get a kill. So he said, okay, cool. So he waited and waited and waited, didn't see a deer, and finally saw something, and he took aim and shot, but it was his friend. Shot his friend, took him to the hospital and um, waited, and the doctor was working on it. Finally, the doctor came out. He said, doc, he said, Did, is he going to make? He said, yeah, he, he's, he's going to pull, he's gonna pull through, but he would have been a lot better off if you hadn't have field dressed him. Now, now, that's a joke, obviously, that didn't really happen, but uh, the moral of the story is, is if you're so desperate in life to get that trophy or to be great, most likely your, your, your aim is not going to be good and there's going to be collateral damage, and that really is the way it is with life. When we want to be great and we want to get trophies and prove ourselves, sometimes the people we love the most can get hurt, and we can just walk all over people or we can trample on people as we as we try to climb the ladder of success. And, and so for years, I thought that God was calling me to be great. So I was a pastor, a leader, and of course, you know, if you're going to be great, you've got to get some trophies. So I got the trophy wife. Y'all, come on, somebody. I was happy about that. So, um, but then I thought, well, I've got to get my hands in everything. So I, I, I uh, conceived and produced an organic bug spray business called New Bug Out, and then I designed and manufactured a high-end yo-yo that was selling in some stores in Indianapolis and Brookstone and Sharper Image back in the day were interested in it. And so I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to have a yo-yo? And so in Terre Haute, I began to be known as the yo-yo guy. And then the newspaper did an article, hey, preacher becomes inventor. And so people say, hey, you're the yo-yo guy. And I thought, that's crazy. So then I authored some books and I've got three or four books here. I thought, man, if I write some books, I can leave a legacy and I can, I can have these trophies and and so, but the cool thing is that, that the gospel saved me from myself. When, when I fully accepted God's unconditional love, when I fully accepted the gospel, the gospel helped me see that I didn't need to be the jack-of-all-trades kind of guy. I, I didn't need to accomplish a lot of great stuff in order to experience the, the greatness that God really wanted to do. And so, when I looked into the Word of God and, and I began to see that God's unconditional love was made available to me, it released me from trying to be great and, and then just step into this calling of being faithful in, in the little things. And here's the big idea today. In, in order to experience greatness, I think the only way to experience greatness is, is to be faithful in the little things. If you're going to experience great things, you've got to be faithful in the little things. And, and I know that that doesn't seem like much, but let me just explain and give you the backstory and, and give you maybe our journey of faith. My wife's going to share a little bit uh, of our story this Friday night at the women's event. Uh, you know, it was about 10 years ago. God's assignment for us was to take a 70-year-old religious church and to transition it to be a life-giving, Christ-centered oasis in Terre Haute, Indiana. 
And it was so exciting because God had changed our hearts. We saw the light of the gospel and the Lord transitioned us from being legalistic to understanding the wonders of God's grace. And so, hey, this is going to be great. Told the board and the church we're all ready for it. And it was like watching an episode of Running Wild with Bear Grylls, you know, biting snakes' heads off and drinking buffalo urine. So exciting. But then, but then it became real. It became terrifyingly real. And instead of running wild, we were walking scared. And we were having to just walk it out. It, 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 was, it, was, it was a slow and painful and fearful process. And I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. When you are called to do something faithful, and you're just being faithful one step at a, at a time, you can become uh, insecure. You can feel intimidated. You, you can feel like maybe you're insignificant. And, 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 and knowing this and seeing God's work in our lives, we knew that God was not calling us without equipping us. We knew that God was, had positioned us, but he was going to empower us to do what he had called us to do if we would just be faithful. And that's what I want to bring to you today and just let you know that no matter where you are in life and whatever your assignment is, it may seem like you're just taking one step at a time. And it's so hard to be faithful in the little things. There's nothing smaller than a step. I mean, what's a step? That's okay. I stepped. All right. There's another step. That's not much. That's not, you know, walking with Christ isn't really sexy, but walking with Christ has eternal rewards because walking with Christ includes helping others in their next steps. That's the cool thing about walking with Christ. It's not just about you. It's about how can God use your life to see others come to know Jesus Christ. When you're walking in Christ or Maybe you said this, when you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you're walking in Christ or walking in the Spirit, there are wonderful things that flow from that. There are great things that come from just faithfully walking. And you think, well, to be a Christian, you know, there's walking boring. I, I want to do some, you know, leaping. And so people want to take leaps of faith. God didn't call you to take a leap, leap of faith. He said, you walk by faith. You walk by faith and not by sight. Just be faithful one step at a time. Walk by faith and not by sight. So many people think, well, you know, uh, I've got to leap. I've got to, I've got to hop. I've got to jump. I've got to run. Well, Christianity is not six frogs a-leaping. It's not seven rabbits uh, running or jumping. And it's not eight grasshoppers hopping. No, it's more like sheep walking. And that's so boring, right? I mean, who wants to just walk? Walking takes so much time. Nobody goes to the stands. I want to, see, I want to see this team of power walkers. Nobody wants to watch someone walk. No, we watch people run and jump and, and, and do all the fun stuff. But just walking, just walking it out. And, and understanding that God's assignment for us back when we were in Indiana was to help people take their next steps. And then we, God reassigned us to Grace Church in Houston. And, and here we are just taking one step at a time. Okay, God, what, what are you doing here? And, we just have to trust that God's using our lives. And then God called us to New Community Church here in Muskogee. And I wake up in the mornings, okay, God, what, 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 are, you, what are you saying? What, and God is saying to me, he's saying to the staff, I think he's saying this to all of us, that he, he's calling us to help us help people find out what their next steps are in Christ so they can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we're developing, we're developing a growth track right now. And you'll be hearing about it next year. I'm thrilled to tell you about it. Growth track 1.0, growth track 2.0, growth track 3.0. And to help people find where they are right now and what does God have for you next. We have the banners on the sides of, of the room. We introduced that last Sunday. And this will become part of our culture is, is that we want to assist you in helping you find your next. If you've accepted Christ in the last few months, well, we want to we tell you how uh, your next steps are going to look and what it means to get in a connect group, what it means to serve in the body of Christ. If you've never experienced salvation and you don't know who Jesus is or you want to know more, we've got little booklets that will help you discover a relationship with Christ and what that really looks like. And yeah, we, we love doing things cool. We love great music, we, we, we lo lo love the building, trying to make the building look nicer, we're re uh, 
we're uh, rejuvenating the kids ministry space you'll see some things in the next few months roll out there and and Shannon's doing a, a, a amazing job leading our worship in this interim period before we hire a worship pastor in a few months who knows when that's going to happen but we believe that God is is taking us step by step but the most important thing is not the aesthetics or not are, are not the cool factor of church but it's the stuff that maybe nobody wants to pay attention to. And that is, find an individual and help them know what their next is. To me, that's how we can experience God's greatness. And that's when we're faithful to the little things. And so when you see the scripture, you look into the word of God, you see these heroes of faith that did just that. For example, let's look at Moses. Moses was the kind of guy that would help people find what their next steps would look like. God's assignment said, Moses, I want you to help my people get out of bondage and go into this land of promise. From the land of bondage to the land of promise. To establish this, this uh, culture of worship, of covenant worship. They were in covenant with the one true God. They were now God's kids. And they would worship him through this observance of Passover lamb. And it was connecting them to God. And so they followed Moses. They walked through the Red Sea. It's step by step. They walked through the wilderness and, and it took them 40 years. Yeah, God gave them shoes that didn't wear out, but they just had to take one step at a time. See, it was not just about changing locations. It wasn't just going from Egypt to the promised land. It was about God transforming hearts. So the years of their journey in the wilderness was God was remaking them and remolding them as a people and establishing a culture a kingdom culture in them of what he was really going to do in them and through them and future generations through which the Messiah would come, Christ himself, the eternal Son of God. And, and, and God was not only calling Moses to do that, he was also calling Moses to raise up a Joshua or the next generation to help them uh, know what their next is. So Joshua follows Moses and, and, and Moses challenges Joshua, hey man, you're going to do this. You're going to take them further than what I, I've done my job, but you now have to do your job. And we want to say to all the, the millennials and all the Gen Zers here at New Community Church, what can we do as a team? What can I do as a pastor to help you find out what your next is so you can find your purpose in life and you can know that God has designed you for a reason, that you're not here by accident. He's got great things that he wants to do in you and through you. And so this was Moses' assignment. And I'll just, I'll just say this. In order to faithfully attend to the little things or in order to just take a step-by-step, -step, it, it, it's going to take a lot of humility. It's going to take obedience. It, 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 it takes courage. It takes responsibility. It, it takes selflessness. So when you receive the gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into your heart, you become a, a humble person. You become an obedient person. You become a courageous, bold person. As you accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become responsible and you steward what God has given you. And you also live a selfless life. You take up the cross and you deny self. And this, this is exactly the life that David lived. David was another character in, in our hero, Heroes of Faith lineup. David was a kind, of, a kind of guy that would steward that calling well. He was anointed to be king as a young child. But it was, years later he became king. But he had a greatness in him that really didn't fully develop or materialize in the eyes of others. And so David was humble. He was faithful to do what no one else wanted to do. And that's tend the sheep, feed the sheep, and protect the sheep. All the other brothers were doing more important things. David's out in the field and he's anointed by Samuel to be the future king of Israel, but he's just doing his job. He's humble, and he's doing what no one else wants to do. David, he, he, he was also obedient. He did, uh, he, he did what others didn't want to do. And, and that, he, went, he went and served others and, and, and helped others that were doing more important things than him. His father said, hey, David, I want you to go take the cheese and this bread and go feed your brothers that are fighting in the heat of the battle. So David was obedient. He, he, he did what, what no one else would want to do, and that is just serve his brothers. He served his brothers. He arrived on the battlefield, provided this home-cooked meal, and they really weren't fighting in the battle. Matter of fact, Goliath was threatening 
them and all the people of God and Saul and the whole army, King Saul and the whole army, they were terrified. They, they sat there galvanized and hypnotized in their tents and the only noise that you heard from those Israeli troops was the knocking of their knees and the chattering of their teeth in unison. But here David, he steps up and he's courageous. He, he's, he's faithful to do what everyone else is afraid to do. He stands up to Saul. He says, Saul, I know you're king, but I can't use your armor. I've got my own method uh, God has taught me how to use this sling. And so he stands up to, to Saul and he says, he proves that he can do it. He stands up to, the, to Goliath. He says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of God, the God of angel armies. So David had this, this courage, this inner courage that God had deposited in him. He was faithful in that. He, D- David was also faithful in his responsibility. He did what only he could do. Now he's king. Now he has this authority. The Ark of God or the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen by the enemy. The Philistines had had it for some time. And they recovered it and took it to the house of Obadidim, a Jewish person. And so David said, we've got to get the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of God. David was the only one that could do that. And so he he was responsible. He did what only he could do. He said, we got it. So he puts it on a cart and they start taking it back to Jerusalem, to the city of God, from the house of Obadidim. And if you do the the math, you see that every six steps, David would offer sacrifices and praise to God. Every every six steps, they would take a few steps, he would offer sacrifices. It took took days for that to happen, for them to get that Ark of the Covenant back to the city of God. And as it got closer to Jerusalem, as the Ark of God's Covenant, the Ark of God's Promise, this artifact that proved that God was with them, right? As it gets closer to the city of Jerusalem, David begins to dance. I mean, he gets jiggy with it. He is so excited. Y'all, about the old covenant, go figure. If he could be that excited about the old covenant and being responsible in bringing it to the people of God, how much more should we get so excited about bringing the good news message, the new covenant of God's grace to God's people or the people that need to know about it? See, David not only was responsible, he was not only faithful to do what only he could do, David was also selfless. He did what benefited future generations. He amassed this great amount of money to to move from like a temporary tabernacle that they were worshiping in to a more permanent temple. Moses brought the tabernacle or a mode of worship. They went into the land, established it, David's now king. David said, we've got to have a permanent house of worship. And so he raised all these funds, but he, he did it knowing that he may never get to see it. He, he empowered and equipped his son Solomon to follow in his footsteps. So, son, we've got to do this. We've got to build God a, a permanent house so people can worship. And so David didn't even get the credit for it. David, David no one praised David. They didn't call it David's temple. They called it Solomon's temple. And so David was able to faithfully steward something that he would never really see. He would never really... And so here's the question. Are you willing to faithfully invest? Are you willing to invest in something that you will not personally benefit from or get credit for in this lifetime? I think that's the definition of being faithful, sticking with it, not giving up. I I know that you might be in a job or you might be in a place in life and your assignment in life, you're just like, God, I don't like this. This is, this is, you know, this is boring and I don't feel like I'm really fulfilling my calling. I'm telling you today that if you just stick with it and you just stay faithful, you just share the gospel, have those conversations, love people, be kind to people, show the fruit of the Spirit. And if you're just faithful one step at a time, you're going to help others find their next step. Let me give you an example. Um, Several years ago, it was about 2009, coming through our big change in Indiana, there was a guy that called me up on the phone. He said, hey, uh, Simeon, you don't know me, but my name is Chris, and uh, I'm in a difficult spot in life. Would you mind, you know, meeting with me? Would you mind just talking with me? I said, sure enough. So we met at a coffee shop, and, and uh, I, 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 I talked with him, and he, he was a, an addict. He, had, he was living at Freebirds, which was a, a halfway house a Christian halfway house. And so I would go every Sunday and I would, I'm not trying to pin roses on me. I'm just telling you what happened. I, I just would go, I'd pick him up in my car and I'd take him to church and, and step by step, I saw God doing a work in Chris. I saw God 
changing his heart. And so I was, had the opportunity of baptizing Chris and found out he was an ex-UFC fighter. He was uh, a mixed martial arts, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, dude. And he fought in uh, Adabi, uh, uh, I forget, some foreign country, never mind. Anyway, he's, he, he's this kind of a guy and didn't know that his parents were, were, were uh, farmers and they were well-known farmers in Illinois. And, but I just, I talked to Chris, he called me just a few days ago and he wants to stop by Muskogee, he wants to come worship with us. And, and, and I said, man, how you doing, Chris? And, and just seeing God help Chris take his next steps. His parents were so impacted by the church and what God was doing in Chris's life. They said, we want to we wanna, we wanna honor what God is doing. Hey, Simeon, we've got a 27-acre campground that our families had for like 50 years, an old Methodist campground that they have youth camps out there. There's, it can sleep 150. Hey, we want to give this to you. I went and met the board they gave me the keys to the place and a checkbook for 40000 Hey, we're giving it because we see what your church has done, has done in my son's life and what you're helping the next generation do. We know you could steward this. And so we started hosting youth camps and saw lives change. And so God reminded I said, Chris, I talked to him yesterday. I said, I want to use your name tomorrow because I'm inspired by your story, how God took the little things that we did in deposit, and that we reap this great reward and to see how God can reach many, many more people. And so my encouraging words to everyone in this room is don't give up. Just keep doing that small thing in a faithful way, and I know that someday you will experience greater things. Let me, let me share with you one other, I believe is a hero in the Scripture, a hero of the faith. It's John the Baptist. And we're in John's Gospel well, John the Baptist is in this story. John the Baptist was baptizing. He had a lot of followers. And so John the Beloved is writing about John the Baptist. And so let's check this out. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a close. Let's check this out in John chapter 3. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some scriptures from John 3, also John 21 and John 14. But I want us to just kind of tie all this together. I hope this makes sense. I think it will. After Jesus, this is verse 22, after Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at an aeon near Salem because water was plentiful there. And the people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion or a conversation, I'm sure it was an argument, it, it arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, or in other words, talking about Jesus, remember Jesus across the Jordan? He who was with you, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. In other words, we're losing our crowd and everyone is starting to follow Jesus now. Look what John, John the Baptist says. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been set before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him, hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. So here John the Baptist is, is saying, he's admitting like, wait a minute. I'm not trying to be great. I'm not trying to get people to follow me. My assignment in life is to help people find out what their next steps are. And it, it is to follow Jesus. I know people are leaving my ministry, but they're going to go follow Jesus. John was smart enough to know that, that he was not the lead actor. He was just playing a supporting role. John was smart enough to know that he was not the groom, he was actually the best man, right? And he definitely wasn't going to run off with the bride. He wasn't going to fall in love more with the church than with Jesus. So he said, we're going to let these people be redirected to Jesus. He knew that if the more people followed Jesus, maybe the less people would follow him. And here's the caveat that I want to add. Yes, as a leader, as a pastor, and as our staff, we try to lead the congregation. My, my, uh, my word would be, don't just follow me or follow us. Follow Jesus Christ. Our role is to help everyone that attends New Community to have an experience. 
in Jesus, to know who the Father is and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if you're just looking at a man, if you're looking at someone to come in and save the day, that's not going to be me. I'm just going to tell you, you need to follow Jesus because Jesus is the only one who saves. Jesus is the only one who can deliver. And at the end of the day, the church is healthy. The church grows. Why? Because people aren't following a man. They're following Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Can I get a witness in this house? Woo! feel like an auctioneer today, but I am fired up. So, 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 so as we're wrapping up today, John helps people step from law to grace. Yeah, Moses got them out of bondage into tabernacle worship through Passover lamb. That's Moses. David got them moving from the tabernacle worship to more of a permanent temple, and he was selfless in this effort. Now John steps on the scene and said, hey, y'all, now it's not just the temple anymore. Jesus is the true temple of God. Jesus is the true Lamb of God. So moving from law to grace. And I think one of the most exciting things for Sonia and I when we took our step, a step of faith, a step towards grace, a step towards preaching the gospel, understanding who Jesus is as the Son of God and what that does for us, that His finished work paid a debt. As we did that, our, our son and daughter, Lemuel and Lisa, were in high school. And I saw how easy it would have been in those early years of ministry to want to prove myself by being the yo-yo guy or being the organic bug spray guy or being the guy that authors a few books. And, and then I did a freelance, freelance graphic design on the side. I had my hands in a lot of stuff, but I was like, wait a minute, God saved me for myself. And I, I just started being faithful. And I understood, like, my kids, that's the mission field for me right now. And so I didn't fall more in love with the church than with Jesus. And I definitely didn't love the church more than my family. So I paid, I paid special attention to Lemuel and Liesel. When I would travel and go speak, I would take one of them with me because I wanted them to be a part of what God was doing. I wanted to transfer something. And, and I know that when you look at the, the heroes of faith and you see, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I know a lot of people want to be, I want to be like Abraham, right? I want to be the friend of God. Or I want to be Jacob who had power with God. But it's like nobody wants to be Isaac. Isaac was this average son of a great father and the average father of a great son. So Isaac could have felt like, man, I'm nobody. But you see, Isaac, out of all the patriarchy in Scripture, he's more like Jesus. He was the faithful son. He was wounded. He could have been wounded or killed by the hands of the father. And he was able to be this transitionary role and, 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 and bridge the gap. And I think if, if you're Isaac, if I'm Isaac, if we're, if we're just feeling, okay, I'm just average, I'm just a nobody, be encouraged because Isaac was the one that had hands to bless the next generation. And so let me say it to the millennials and to the Gen Zers. We here at New Community, we want to lay our hands on you, if you please. And we want to, we want to bless you. We want to say, go for it. You, you, can, you can do it greater, but it's not you doing the great. It's the Holy Spirit doing the great. It's not about being great in a worldly sense, you know. It's about who's the greatest. No, it's not about that. It's a different kind of greatness. That the gospel, as it's stewarded into your hearts, you will be able to reach more people. You will be able to impact more people because that's God's assignment for us to just pass it on. To pass. So, so my question, here, here, it's a huge question. Are you able to stick with it and to do that small thing faithfully? Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. It may seem like there's not a lot happening. You're not sprinting. You're not doing backhand springs. You're not wowing the crowd, but you're just sticking with it. You're just being faithful. You will experience great things if you'll be faithful in the little... And, and let me just say this. The great things are not stranger things. So I think, well, if you're going to be really spiritual, it's got to be really... No. The great things are powerful and life-changing and life-giving. You know, Jesus said, out of all of the prophets, there's not one that's greater than John the Baptist. But he said, the least in the kingdom... This is in Luke 7. The least in the kingdom 
is greater than John the Baptist. This is an encouraging word for someone that feels small, you feel insignificant, you feel average, you feel even like worthless, but the least in the kingdom. The one who's just started in their faith. Jeremy and I and Evan, we've been doing some painting in the old youth room. We're, 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 we're starting the process and there's, uh, Mark is helping and, and Dwayne, we're, we're, we're redoing that room and we're going to go room to room. But we had, the, we had the honor of meeting with one of, the, one of the newer members of New Community Church who's been attending for about a month or so and you don't know him. I'm not going to mention his name, but he's been unpacking his story and, and he was, he was uh, caught up in alcoholism and, and he said since he's been here, He's been coming. God's been changing his heart. He hasn't smoked cigarettes in I don't know how many days now. And God is doing an amazing thing. He's telling us his story. And I, I woke up the other morning. I could hardly wait to get here. Not to paint. Painting's cool. But, man, just to meet with this guy again. We've been breaking bread, having lunch, and just hearing his story. And this is why. This is why we're here in Muskoka. This is what it's all about. It's hearing people's stories and then helping them take their next steps. And we're all at different levels. We're on this journey, we're all at different levels. And, and at the end of the service, Jeremy and Evan will be on either side. And we want to, we're creating a culture where if you want to know what your next steps are, we want to help you. We want to walk you through it. We, want to, we don't want to drop the ball here. Because we can build a big church and we can have all the bells and whistles, but if we're missing this, we're missing the main thing. And that's helping you take your next steps. You know, Jesus said... Was it in, uh, let me say, no, John, in John 21, it says this. Check this out. If you were to take all the things that Jesus did and put them in books, the world could not contain all the books because Jesus did so many things. We, we couldn't even write about it. It's so, so many. It's amazing what he did in 33 years. But in John 14, Jesus basically said, if you believe in me, You'll do, the works, you'll do the works that I do, but you'll even do greater things. Well, wait a minute. I thought about that. How is that possible? It's, it's not like we're in competition with John the Baptist or in Jesus, and, it, and, and it's not that we are trying to be greater than anyone. What does it mean to do greater works? That would be impossible to, to mass produce miracles, and you know, certainly we're not going to go die on the cross. How, how can we? Jesus is not saying that we're going to do more miracles than him. You know what he's saying? When he said, greater works than what I do, or you're going to do, he's like, if you believe the gospel, you're going to help other people take their next steps. And check it out, y'all. If you help someone go f from bondage to freedom, if you help someone trans transition from a life of sin to a life of, of a deliverance in Christ, knowing that they're God's kids, they're going to live forever. They're going to inherit the earth. They're going to... They're, it's an eternal existence, which is greater than opening the blinded eyes. It's greater than unstopping a deaf ear. It's greater in the sense, not that you're doing it, but it's the God in you doing it. And so whatever you ask in His name, He does it as it relates to sharing the gospel. Lord, I want to impact my world. I want to see my friends come to know Christ. Jesus is going to use your life, and you will experience great things. You say, well... Wow, man, I'm so intimidated. The, the, there's so much darkness in the world. There's, the world's getting more and more wicked. There's the spirit of Antichrist, and people are just so opposed to, 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 to even want to accept the gospel, and you can have this fear factor creep on you. But 1 John 4 basically says that, yeah, there's this spirit of Antichrist and people that do not say that Christ has come in the flesh. They're not of God, but he said, he's checking out. He said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The God in you, in you, because of your faith in Christ, there is so much greatness, so much of a deposit that's been placed in your life, and God is asking you to step it out, and it's once, just be faithful, and your life is going to have a huge impact. Don't give up. Don't quit. Our assignment in, in Grace Church, I took off my lead pastor hat for four years, and I stepped into a lesser role in a mega church. And sometimes it can just seem so, you're like you're invisible sometimes in, in such a large crowd. My wife and I just were faithful. Have Bible studies, love people, love people. Got a text just two days ago that just blew my mind. Thank you for the seeds planted. And, and so I feel like the Lord showed me that, like, you know what? Nothing goes unrewarded 
This is kingdom work we're doing. It's supernatural. It's spiritual. It's awesome. Let's stay with it, y'all. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Why don't you stand with me? What a great day this has been. I've enjoyed teaching God's Word. And I pray for you this week. I pray that God would truly open your heart so that you can receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. And before we, before we worship, and had just pause, push the pause button just for a minute. I want to pray for you. Father, I, I thank you for this, this church. I thank you for this group of people, this body. Thank you for the work that you're doing in us. And Lord, yeah, we admit that we're all at different levels and some have been in this thing for a while. Some are new to it. I pray that you would just give us the confidence, the courage, the boldness to, to just ask you what our next step should be as we walk the Christian walk. I pray, Lord, that as you equip us and empower us, help us, yes, to steward that and to help others find their next steps. Because we know, Lord, this is not just about us. It's not just about us. It's about what you're going to do through us and in the lives of others. And we pray this in Jesus' name.